Um, <clears throat> it's very, very important. I sent my mom a picture of my new kitten the other day. Spoiler, everyone, I got a new kitten. She's amazing. She's locked outside the studio right now. Um, but I sent my mom a photo and she, my mom texts back and says, oh, she's perfect. And I said, oh, I love you. And she comes back with, should I say she's perfect? Like with the word per in there. I appreciate the pun. Do you, yeah. I mean, I know that in the UK, maybe that's not how the sounds go. Um, but, but yes, it was a face palm moment. So I, think, I, just, I think that's what you call a groaner. It, it really was. Ugh. Yeah, it was, it was amazing because for all the, the glamour of dad jokes, there's really a lot to be said for, for moms who are holding it down out there. So take a minute to uh, give a little credit and love to the mom jokesters out there. It's like, yeah, mom's got, mom's got jokes. They're terrible, <laughs> just as terrible. And I, jokes aren't just for dad. I love them so much. Yeah, it's called equality and we love it. So I am going to quickly, I say that every time, it never turns out to be quick. Um, I am going to switch over to share a more helpful screen and then figure out how to get back. Bing. Nope, there we go. Yes, is this me? Hi, hey, hey, look at us go. Well, we've got a lot of folks uh, joining us from uh, out there in live stream land on Facebook as well as on YouTube. And I am Beth from AutoCrit and I have with me Gareth here today. Say hi, Gareth. Back once again. Hello, everybody. No problem. Hi, everybody. Um, great to have you with us, Gareth, and everyone out there watching today. We are going to talk about readability. So first, thank you to everyone in the community who answered our poll about um, what topics you'd love to hear about. And we are working on some really fun stuff for the um, top votes in that poll. We're actually working on fun stuff for a lot of other things. But um, just to know, let you know that we did hear you. I know this wasn't our top vote getter in the community. We had a lot of other feedback around readability. So we wanted to share this one with you um, with you today and then let you know we've got some really great stuff up our proverbial sleeves coming soon for you in our AutoCrit author community. Um, thank you. Uh, so let me tee up one quick question as we start to get started. As we start, I'm fixing to get started. I know, Gareth, it's terrible today. Uh, readability, why? Why do you think that's important? And I, I have the answer in my next slide. So I'm just going to let that go out there for a minute. Gareth, what do you think? Um, what do you think makes readability important? Ooh, well, if, if I were to say, I'd probably give away the answer completely. Um, <laughs> <I know. laughs> because it's, it's the only thing that, goes, that comes straight to my mind. Um, but obviously, readability is all to do with um, the accessibility of of your text. And what does that really, what's that really mean accessibility? Because we hear that word a lot, but put that into, into a context for us. Well, I mean, the easiest context for, for any kind of book is the more people that can read it, stick with it and finish it, the bigger an audience you have. So it's more accessible to a greater market. The yeah. mass market, one might say, is mass market paperbacks and whatnot. Um, however, there is something uh, Bobby mentioned there, which is know your audience as well. Uh, that is an important part of readability because people don't like to be spoken down to just as much as they don't like to be confused or feel like it's going over their head. So that's a good point. Yes. If, if reading for work, I don't mind if it feels like work. Do you know what I'm saying? So I'm reading books about the industry or for, you know, about technology or whatever. But if I'm reading for fun and reading to, to, you know, learn personal things and be entertained, what I call mental Oreos, mental junk food, I don't want it to be difficult. I don't want it to be super, super hard. Um, the big thing for me around why readability is important is readability equals sales. 
right? So let's break it down. Everything in life has to do with money, it seems. So the more people that the more people can read your book, the more they will buy it and share with their friends and spread the word. And, you know, that is really what's going to drive your sales. If it's not um, at a nice, common readability level, you are not as likely to get as many sales and you're not as likely to get as much really fun in, and encouraging reader feedback, right? So at the bottom of the, of the bottom line, at the end of the day, at the bottom of the day, I like to make up new, feel free to use that one. Uh, the readability of your book will directly impact sales, will directly impact your reader's enjoyment, will directly impact how many people can really relate to your content and really get it. You know, you have a story to tell or you have information to impart in the in the world of nonfiction or you want to help people with your prescriptive nonfiction. It helps to be able to reach more people. And that is what readability is all about. A couple of stats about that. If you want your book to be accessible to 85% of the public, and this is a US statistic, your mileage may vary if you're overseas, Australia, UK, um, South Africa, et cetera. But generally speaking, 85% of the public in America, your reading level needs to be about the eighth grade. And we have a little bit more information about what age that would be. And so you can maybe make some direct correlations to the grades um, overseas, but I just thought that was fantastic is 85% of the public for your work to be accessible to 85% of the public. So people everywhere that can read a level of the eighth grade. It do, I don't even remember what I was reading in eighth grade, but I'm probably still reading the same things now for fun. So the other interesting stat is when we're talking about readability and how you can use AutoCrit to improve your readability, if you improve it from a score that's, that puts you in that 12th grade reading level, if you improve that from a grade 12 to a grade 5, now that is higher than or lower grade than the previous slide just said, but increasing it that much and taking it down to a fifth grade reading level will increase your finishers. So that's people who not only buy and pick up your book, start to read it, but they read the whole thing. They finish your, your book. Increase your finishers by 83%. And that is money in the bank. Um, that is more satisfied readers. That is more pleasant reviews. That is more popular feedback on Amazon or whatever you're choosing to do. Or even if you're just writing for yourself and your family, you're writing something that will be a treasured memoir for your grandchildren. It's going to be more likely to get finished. It's going to be a more enjoyable, more engaging, more pleasant experience for them. If you keep that reading level a little bit, uh, uh, I don't want to say simplified, but more accessible. I see where you got, <laughs> where you got that word now, Gary. Sim simplified isn't isn't you know too bad of a way to to say it anyway because at the end of the day when you're writing whether you're telling a story or whether it's you know informational nonfiction getting your point across clearly clear communication is is key it's the point and it's just good writing um, with this particular statistic I mean grade five uh, a little bit lower than you would maybe set the benchmark or, as we'll, we'll show later on. But uh, the sheer amount of increase you get of people that actually finish the book is incredible. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, those those that finish are the ones that will be your raving fans and and oh, absolutely. Buy that yeah. word of mouth advertising so you can get more and more people to to buy your book. So in terms of getting your message across plainly, um, what really plays into that? And we at Autocrit after lots of painstaking observation and research have come up with really three generally common areas that all readability statistics take into consideration. So top three things, complexity. So word, typically word complexity, sentence length and common words. So Gareth, can you tell us a little bit about each of those each of those items? Yeah, um, in a minute or two, we'll take everybody through the 
sort of histories of the different uh, readability tests and what they're meant for. And uh, these are the ones that we specifically have inside of Autocrit. But most of them use variations on these three same things. Um, the first one, complexity, is normally, as Beth said, per word complexity. So that's number of syllables. And I, I think they take, well, most of them anyway, will take uh, words of three syllables or more as being complex. And then one or two syllables are, are simple or simple words. Um, in terms of sentence length, that's sentence length. <laughs> you don't want them being too Tell long. Tell me more about the length of this <laughs> thing. Hmm. How many commas can we fit in? Uh, you know, <laughs> is this one big gigantic rambling sentence? Um, I think from doing all previous sort of what's the scores and things like that, if you've joined us for those uh, or read them on the blog, you'll tend to see that most of the sort of Bass uh, famous authors will stick around nine words per sentence on average. So they're not terribly long sentences at all. Um, and then the third one is common words. Uh, this is simply words that are more common in general speech. So words that would not be used in everyday talk uh, among the wider population are considered uncommon. Uh, and these are, with the tests that use these, they actually use word lists. So they build their own list of words that they would consider uncommon and put those into the uh, the formula. So it this that one always makes me think of between number one and number three. I I spent many years working in corporate America, and they're notorious for using complex multi-syllable words where a very common short word would suffice. So you can't help but day by day invigorate the synergy of your daily surroundings with blue sky thinking. Yeah, yeah, and, and honestly. <laughs> Like I, I've worked with lots of folks who genuinely never use the word use because they use utilize every single time. So they utilize the word utilize instead of utilizing use. Uh, and that that's just my favorite example is like, just say use. You don't have to utilize everything. Yeah, this is what it's, corporate life will do to you. It's almost ruining me, but that's okay. That's okay. Okay, we are all good. So what we're going to do today, now that we're all kind of on the same uh, on the same general page about why readability is important and the major three components of readability, as you're all aware, Autocrit provides tons and tons of readability scores for your perusal and enjoyment. So lots of great things about that. Number one, there's a lot of math behind these calculations. Uh, Gareth and I just spent a, a pretty fair amount of time going through these calculations and, and just some of these are kind of hilarious and we'll get into them, but there are uh, nine, I believe, is that right, Gareth? Nine? I think it was nine, yeah. And nine different readability scores that we include in your auto crit subscription. And this is one of the reports that is free, right? It's a, it's a free forever benefit, the readability scores. So we're going to take you through each of those nine and bear with us. We're not going to make you do math. Um, there will not be a quiz later about who did, who does what score and the, you know, the square root of anything. So just kind of sit back and enjoy kind of how these three components come together and form the nine different scores that AutoCrit provides you. We'll give a little context um, around each of those as well. And then Gareth's going to actually jump into AutoCrit and show you some popular novels that we have in our AutoCrit system and show you a little bit about their scores. And maybe we'll find something surprising in there. Sound good, Gareth? That sounds excellent. Fantastic. So let's head out to the wild. Uh, I'll do Dale Chal. So this is um, Dale Chal and his colleague, Professor Dale Chal, and his colleague actually founded the Harvard Reading Lab. So when you hear Dale Chal and he, this score is incredibly popular, it comes with the cloud of like Harvard University behind it. It's really focused mainly on sentence length and what they consider difficult words. So multi syllable mul mul lots of syllables. How do you say that word? Multi-syllabic. Multi and polysyllabic. <laughs> See again, long words. How about we just do that? Um, and then 
kind of do their own calculations against that. The key with Del Chal is it really started out being about textbooks. Um, it was really around education, as you might expect, since this is these are the founders of the Harvard Reading Lab. Um, but the final score is your grade, right? So it doesn't exactly equate one to one, but the score then maps to a, a grade score, a, a grade score that you can see on my screen right now. Uh, yes, everybody can see that, right? Okay. Um, where you're, where I've circled this is kind of where you want to be to get the most bang for your buck. Um, YA can go a little bit lower. Um, some of the really complex self-help can go, or uh, nonfiction can go higher, but I just wouldn't recommend going higher than what I have circled, which is max a 12th grade reading level here in the US, 11th or 12th grade. So Dale Chaw, you'll see as one of the just benchmark measures out there. We love it. And it really has to do with two of those three complex those three aspects that we talked about before um, the readability in general for Dale Chal, though it started with textbooks, it is very universal because a lot of people are still going to give up on reading that they find incomprehensible. And if it's at a 15th grade or a college level, you know, a lot of people, especially who are reading for fun, are just maybe not going to embrace that. So Moving on, I'm going to hand it to Gareth for our next score, which I believe is Powers Summer, Powers Curl. Summer Curl. So yeah, as Beth says, I mean, most readability skills were born from education. Um, that's why I guess the majority of them come with great, you know, US grade levels uh, supposed to be. Is this textbook suitable for the information within to be clearly communicated to people, uh, children within these grades? But they are equally useful universally because writing is writing at, at the end of the day and are, are you being clear or are you not but uh, this particular skill uh, was created by rd powers wa sumner and be curl back in 1958 uh, in a journal called a recalculation of four adult readability formulas so they recalculated some uh, previously created uh, uh, formulas meant for adults because this one is uh, gauged towards children's books um, you can see the it comes up with a reading age at the end based on these numbers. The one thing we couldn't find out about these formulas were why the creators came where in the with numbers these came from. numbers. <laughs> yeah. It's like, where did they come from? Why are you multiplying by this much? <laughs> but, it's very precise. And this is it. That makes me feel like there's a ton of research behind it. And it's been around for uh, ooh, 60 something years now. Mm. So, you know, um, but yeah, it's, as I said, it, this one's best for children's books. It's not considered um, sort of within the sphere to be particularly useful for those above a reading age of 10. So um, if you're right, if you're writing children's books, you might want to pay attention to this one. Interesting. Oh, yeah. So that's did you, this is the one that goes primarily for kids under 10. Is that what you said? So, but it, would it still be good for maybe YA, maybe young middle readers? Yeah, I'm not so sure. It might it might push a little above, but I think once you once you get into YA um, and, and teen writing, that tends to start moving a bit more into the, the sort of sphere of what what you might call quote unquote proper fiction. Mm. And I I think I I recently read that I it really trends more toward the one of the scores you're going to do later. I'm not going to, I'm not going to give it away. <laughs> I'm not going to give it away. So let's look at the next one. And I think I'm saying this correctly, but if anybody knows differently, let me know. Spash? Spocky? I thought it was Spatch, but I have not Spash? heard a, a I like pronun the pronunciation of it. Hmm. We'll just call him George because we're best friends now. Um, this one was developed again, also for the younger set. And this one too is from 1952. So we have a lot of 
uh, classic standards that have been in place for many, many years as that make up these readability tests. And you'll see that occur across all the tests we're going to talk about today. This one has uh, both a word list, so unique and unfamiliar words play in there, as well as the average sentence length. And so, so this one is average sentence length, meaning the count of words in, a, in the average sentence. Um, and then a factor of the percentage of unique, unfamiliar words. It's really geared toward children, um, but it does give you then that educational grade level results that the writing would be suitable for. Um, they have revised it since 1952 to include more, uh, a different word list, not, not necessarily more or less, but they have revised and updated that word list to give it a little bit more modern context um, speaking of modern context, did I just read, Gareth, I did, that they've now added the word irregardless to the dictionary? <laughs> Here we go. This Is this, what's next, 2020? Come on. That's too much for me. I can't. Uh, so I, I don't think they added this, that word to this one, but it just made me think of that. The revised edition with the updated word list is what we're reflecting here, and that's what's reflected in the AutoCrit app. So when you run this uh, space, spatch test, that's what you're getting. That And it'll give you um, a grade level. We don't have a, a grid for it, but it's a one-to-one. -one. Let's see. How about Coleman? Do you want to take that one? Yeah, let's. Gareth, why don't you show us? What Coleman and Lau are up to. Go. Okay. Yeah, the, the Coleman Lau tech, uh, this is Coleman Lau index test, isn't it? Um, designed by Mary Coleman and TL Lau. Um, and this one, again, just like pretty much all the other tests, gives you a US, approximate US grade level uh, at the very end. However, this one, I think, is only one of two in the list that um, actually uses the number of characters in the text rather than the syllables in the words. So uh, it seems to me it's easier for machines to perform that calculation based on the number of characters rather than trying to have a computer figure out um, <laughs> how many syllables are in a, in a block of text. The formula there looks like something to do with liquid at a glance. Um, so it's, it's a bit confusing. Yeah. But it is uh, the coleman Lau index is equal to um, the 0.0588L, uh, where L is the average number of letters per 100 words. And the S that you see in the second part is the average number of sentences per 100 words. Um, there's some debate really as to how useful overall this index is. <laughs> Simply based on the fact it's pure raw, you know, character data rather than anything else. But I assume they've tweaked the um, tweaked the numbers so it makes sense in the end and kind of falls in line with the other tests. But uh, as far as I know, it's not not widely used. Yeah, it, that's interesting because you mentioned there are only a couple that use the character count instead of the syllables. And it kind of makes sense in that if there are more characters, there would likely be more syllables. But from a machine learning perspective, it is easier to count widgets than to try and analyze the cadence and the syllables of a word. So I can I can see that. So it's interesting. Yeah, it would take, um, I think to do it with syllable wise, you, you would you would actually have to program a database of language that knows how many syllables are in a, a given word, which is yeah. a lot more work. Uh, it, it really is. I'm, and we we have actually done a lot of that work. So we know of what we do. <laughs> we know. Uh, Natural language. Process. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it is a lot of work. But um, that being said, it's, it's still really helpful. So there are tons of ways to start looking at this. This next one um, is a mind blower for me. Um, it really will apply to a lot of nonfiction because it's primarily recommended for healthcare materials. So it is the smog. And I'm not even making this up. I couldn't if I tried. Smog stands for simple measure of gobbledygook. It was developed by a guy named Henry McLaughlin back in 1969. Oh, oh, in the 60s. Okay, that that explains it much better for me. Um, simple measure of gobbledygook. And then I look at the formula. Nothing about that says that it's simple. It, it's got a square root in it. This is just um, an intense one, in my opinion. But it's really just the count 
of the words that are more than two syllables in a sample of 30 sentences with a square root and some rounding and some other numbers around it. Um, for all the time that it's called a simple measure, it has about six steps to calculate it. And there's a square root in there and the word polysyllable, which you know I struggle with. Um, this is one where we are all thankful that the computer of Autocrit does this for us and we don't <laughs> have to calculate it ourselves. And it's funny how like, even despite the very, you know, funny name, um, this is one of the most preferred readability things for, uh, as Beth said, the healthcare documentation mm -hmm. still today. Wow. Hmm. All right. No gobbledygook in healthcare. No gobbledygook. <laughs> Some would argue that it's, it's all gobbledygook. So that makes it more ironic, I think. Let's throw it over to Gareth and talk about, this is one of my favorites coming up. So I will let you take it away. <laughs> uh, this this is probably my favorite as well. I mean, if, if, if you've been on with me on the previous What's the Score lives, you'll see. Uh, and if you read the What's the Scores, I pretty much go on Flesh Kincaid or Flesh Reading East these days. It's one of the most universal, uh, I guess, alongside the New Deal chawl um, for pretty much anything you're writing. It's it's, it's a great catch-all. Um, as per other stuff, it gives you a you know final grade. Now, there's two versions of Flesh. Um, you have the Flesh Reading Ease, which was the original test that was devised by Rudolf Flesh when he was working for the Associated Press, hence the kind of universal nature of it. Um, but the U.S. Navy later adapted it for their documentations uh, and their, their training materials into the Flesh Kincaid score um, that's not used. So that translates into an FK score, which gives you, as you can see here, 60 to 50, 70 to 60. They translate to, you know, roughly into the grades. Uh, and we'll show you in a minute how some books fall into that area, Elizabeth. <laughs> Sorry, we'll, show, we'll show you that in a moment. Um, with the flesh reading ease, the, the higher the score, the more accessible it is. So it, it's kind of upside down there as to what you might expect. You you want to be getting higher on that. Mm -hmm. um, typically, it tends to go up to 100, but I think you can actually get some phrases that go higher, like uh, the cat sat on the mat, I think is 116 mm -hmm. or yeah. something because it's so simple. Um, now, this is, as I said, pretty much the most often used one today. Um, if like me, if you've any experience in marketing uh, and talking to copywriters and people like that, you've more than likely met a whole bunch of them who are just obsessed with their FK score. Mm -hmm. uh, they'll spend days <laughs> in so different softwares just trying to get it down as low as possible. And then like, oh, I got my FK to a five. This is amazing. It's like, <laughs> it's not necessarily great stuff. <laughs> you just it made it incredibly easy to read. Uh, so everybody's everybody's into the FK these days. Uh, all the kids. All, all, the, cool the, kids. all the cool kids are, are using the FK. <laughs> but they're not striving for a five. They're striving for more like a 75, I think. <laughs> <laughs> All the kids. <laughs> I love it. This one is my favorite. It seems to really give me the best feel for overall readability. Um, and I'm not exactly sure why. I think it's just, it resonates with me. Being able to, to Maybe inside I am a 13 to 15 year old student and that's where my head is. So that plain English, like around a 70, anywhere from a 50 to a 70, or maybe up even high, as high as an 80 or so, you're going to be in great shape with the flesh concave score. Yeah. I do like the, just the chart, you know, it's, it's yeah. nicely that I play in English, that this is plain conversational English mm -hmm. um, or fairly difficult or difficult. And you've obviously got up to the graduates where you're, you're writing some specialized stuff, which again is perhaps not that much of a problem. If you, if you literally are writing to a specialized audience and there's really nothing you can do about it. Yeah. It's you know, fine. No, know your audience. Yes, the the professional writing that a lot of a lot of authors do is, you know, in the nonfiction space primarily is complex, uh, and you don't want it to you go through a brisk pace. You need to really bring it down to to uh, a slower pace to really dig in with the complex words because they're complex con conversations you're having and complex concepts that you're trying to convey. Ooh, that's a lot of alliteration. Um, but ha so having that professional level manuscript, that that uh, college graduate 
courseware, course books, published page papers in academia absolutely are going to be very, very high. Those are not um, things that are typically read for fun. I mean, maybe, maybe. I bet Stephen Hawking reads a lot of that for fun, but uh, it's not the uh, mass market that that Gareth mentioned earlier. So love that one. Good job. Let's talk automated readability index. So this guy was originally developed for real time tracking or near real time of readability on electric typewriters. So who remembers typewriters <laughs> and the electric ones? You could actually count the characters and the keystrokes. So this one is the second one in our series today that looks at the character count rather than the syllables. And you can see the, the fairly complex uh, formula that they use to calculate the readability index, automated readability index, and then a little chart that uh, we pulled. By the way, tons of these are on Wikipedia. If you forget what's, what's here, Wikipedia is a great source for these particular grids and you can just look right at it and see where you are. But I circled, you know, eighth through 11th grade, kind of that sweet spot for reaching that 85% of readership here in the US um, around that eighth to 11th grade level. So this gives you the US grade score um, all the way down to kindergarten and all the way up to, you know, professorial level and above, I guess. If you get a 14, that's going to be pretty much the most complex that you could you could get according to this automated readability index. So that one is included in Autocrit as well. Ooh, I like this next one too. I'd be interested in knowing like what is, considering we have the automated re readability index and was it the Coleman Lao, which was the, also, the other character based one? Mm -hmm. I'd be really interested in just finding out why are they different? You know, they're, <laughs> they're taking much the same thing why is the calculation completely different? It was those the numbers and the factors that they that they apply? Yeah, it's it's been, and I'll just share with the audience that we did a ton of research around how the numbers were arrived at and trying to understand the scientific method behind those numbers. But it's incredibly difficult to get that information outside <laughs> of pure academia. So if anybody has resources, feel free to share them with us. That'd be some interesting info. So, well, this one, next one here, the Gunning Fog Index. Uh, as you can see, again, we're looking at uh, sort of US grades of uh, education. Um, this one was developed by a consultant called Robert Gunning, who actually worked helping organizations clean up their writing and make it more accessible. Literally, his job was in readability. Um, he made materials easier to read. So to help with that, he came up with a formula to make it easier for both him and his clients. Uh, as you can see, there's the formula. 0.4 words over sentences, and then we have complex words over the number of words. So again, complex words, this is going to be those of three or more syllables. Um, it's quite a simple test based on, you know, can, compared to some of the others, kind of similar to the Flesh Kincaid, because just 0.4 and 100, these are simple numbers, not, not point not five eight eight times this. So uh, people tend to like this one because of the simplicity. It's, it generally gets uh, praise for that. But in the wider sphere um, of publishing, really in any kind of market, uh, it's ignored in favor of Flesh Kincaid, which can't really explain as it's a, it's a decent little formula, but uh, that's that's life. And I, the thing I love about this one is that it's called the Gunning Fog Index. And you think, who who's fog? And that person's not mentioned anywhere. There came a time in Gunning's own work where he was getting feedback about fog in his own writing and the fog that was obscuring, obfuscating, hiding the content and the facts and the, the message that he wanted to get across. So that's where he came up with the phrase fog index. So I thought that was pretty interesting. It's actually foggy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We have one more to look at today before we go to the uh, examples that Gareth is going to walk us through. Lynn Sear Wright. Lynn Sear? I'm going to go with that pronunciation. I think it is Lynn Sear. Cool. Um, this one's actually, as Flesh Kincaid was given to us by the Navy, I believe. Was that right, Gareth? Yes. This one uh, was actually developed by the U.S. Air Force. 
So it's very specialized, kind of like fog is, or smog is very specialized to the healthcare documentation and content. This one is really designed to gauge the complexity of Air Force technical manuals. And I did see someone in our live comments saying, um, the tech, they used to write technical manuals and their standard for tech manuals for mechanics who would be maintaining aircraft was to edit them to an eighth grade level and no higher. And these are people that are obviously very smart. They're able to maintain aircraft, um, but that writing to that eighth grade level and keeping it direct and simplified and, and very clear, it really pays off. And so the same concept applies in this Linsear uh, idea for the complexity of the Air Force tech manuals. Even when something's really technical, you can still make it accessible. Here, they talk about the, the easy words and hard words. Easy words, two or fewer syllables, hard words, um, anything above you know three or more syllables. And they score them. An easy word gets one point, a hard word gets three points. You divide them, blah, 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 divide it, carry the two. At least there's no square root in here. But again, um, as with all the other tests that we've been talking about, it is, Time, time to tip our thankful and appreciative hat to the Autocrit software for doing this for us because there's a lot of logic involved. Um, there are even provisional results in this one. But the end result provided to you um, on this one from Autocrit is a US grade level, similar to most of all the other ones. At the end of the day, any of these results would translate into a reader age or a reader grade level. So you can really get a feel that's in a context you can understand uh, for the complexity of your reading and the accessibility of your reading or the dare I say the readability of your of your work. So those are the nine reports that uh, are in, in this one the Lincea writes I just want to point out the word gobbledygook comes back oh, up again. Yes oh I didn't even I didn't even tell you about that part. I love it they would, <laughs> they would just have fisticuffs with the smog team. The gobbledygook has got to go. In, that their idea and the cal calculation for Lindsay back in 1966, um, gobbledygook has got to go. Funny though, that the smog one came out three years later. So apparently gobbledygook was big in the sixties. Mm, sounds I'm, like a sixties word. I, it really does. I'm just going to leave that alone because there are way too many jokes to make. And on that note, we shall hand over to, um, we're going to hand over to Gareth and let him show us, in specific context, what uh, some of our Autocrit content writers have scored and some interesting things in there. I'm going to switch your screen. Uh, is that you? Yeah. There we go. And you, sharing. Go ahead, you are sharing, Gareth, and I'm going to go ahead and uh, enlarge your screen so we're not visible. Should make that a little more visible for our viewers. Take it away. Okay, so I've just loaded up a few of the books that I have inside uh, the system working with right now. Um, the first one you'll recognize from, was it last week, maybe a couple of weeks ago, we did uh, The Silent Wife by Karen Slaughter, who's this mm. month's, uh, well, last month's author edition. We'll have more information on this month's pretty soon. And I've just run a series of books through to show you the readability tests. So these are the uh, nine that we went through and uh, the required grade level. So as we mentioned, they all kind of come out with a, a grade level. And um, just below, because these are grade levels, we then have the scoring ones. So the flesh reading E's. Um, I must, I, I, I left out the McAlpine E flaw. Oh no. Look at that one. But uh, this, this is why I'm just so obsessed with flesh. Um, <laughs> the score of 80 there, you may have to, because I've only got one screen here, um, check the chart for me. I will Let's see what grade an 80 comes in at an 80 on the fresh Kincaid is right between sixth grade and seventh grade. Uh, so there we have a score of 80 for that. And you'll notice that the flesh Kincaid, because they are different tests of so flesh reading ease would give you that the flesh Kincaid um, that was adapted by the Navy actually comes out at a, a lower required grade simply because flesh reading ease is the original flesh Kincaid is the revised. Mm. Um, but either way, they're still, you know, solid results. Uh, I tend to stick with flesh reading ease rather than going straight for the FK, but the, the FK is still valid. 
So there we have. This is the Silent Wife. And what have we got? So we have an 80. And I guess roughly we're falling in around a 4 or 5 uh, grade level here. We get some disparity. And it's going to be different in Smog because that's not designed for this kind of thing. Uh, moving on, our next book. I thought we'd check out the sweeping fantasy of a Game of Thrones. And once again, as much as you might think it's complicated because of all these characters and dragons and mysticism happening, it's actually uh, once more falling in around 4 or 5. The Flesh Reading Ease has gone up to 87, uh, which I believe actually makes it its the same grade boundary as 80, but it's on the way to an easier read. And now, Gareth, one quick call out on this screen. The readability statistics are not a comparative report in Autocrit, right? So we can see at the top, it's comparing your text to Karen Slaughter, but not every report compares um, against a genre or author. Quite um, right, yeah. If you're looking at my screen. To make sure we are yeah. <laughs> I just left that in. Uh, that's from yeah. the last time I was using the system to, to learn <laughs> stuff. <laughs> but um, no, the, the readabilities are not comparative to um, authors or other books. The only thing they are doing is literally running the uh, appropriate formula test. Fantastic. And um, I think you mentioned a moment ago that the FK has a required grade level. What does that actually mean is that what's that mean a uh, required grade level oh from these here yeah. um this is the expected us grade level in terms of education that somebody would be to be able to read your book without having too many problems mm -hmm. okay so fourth graders apparently should be reading a game of thrones i don't think that's right but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's uh, so keep keeping in mind it is the uh, length of the words, the length of the sentences, etc., and not so much the content and subject matter. Yes, yeah, so as I say, in, in the in the uh, what's the scores a lot? It's it's not so much about it's not about the content. <laughs> Be careful of the content. <laughs> so it's so not the. Like a the next book, rating or anything. I'm not sure I'll be able to remember all of these going along, but we had an 80. Now we've got an 87. Um, Next up, I loaded in Interview with the Vampire by Anne Rice. And once more, I think at a quick glance, if you leave out uh, things like smog, Gunning Fog seems a decent bit higher than the others. But uh, we're kind of sitting around a fifth grade, I think, average. And the Flesh Reading Ease falls in at 82. So we so far have been entirely between 80 and 90. Yeah, so this is right around the sixth grade level, which in the Flesh Kincaid um, scale is very much considered conversational English for the majority of US consumers. Yep. Uh, on the back of that, I loaded in Green Mile by Stephen King. Ooh. So you know um, Stephen King's earlier novels, um, you know, the, 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 the kind of the times have changed since King's early days. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, the writing maybe isn't as clear as it as it could be nowadays, but nope, 83 on the yeah. flash reading ease. And the rest, once more, I think it, uh, if we kind of glanced at that and thought, let's add them up and, and sort of average, we're looking around fifth grade. So it's uh, becoming quite a, a thread to follow here. And finally, I loaded in The Servants of Twilight by uh, an author I like called Dean Kuntz. And once more, we're moving a little higher. We have a 78, which means it's a little more difficult than the previous ones. I think that goes into, it just crosses one of the boundaries, doesn't it, 78? It does. It puts that to seventh grade, which is still considered fairly easy to read. Fairly easy to read. And The Servants of Twilight, this is one of the books. I'm, I'm not going to go out on a limb and say 100% for certain, but I'm pretty sure this was published either in the 80s or the very early 90s. Um, and it was one of these sort of uh, you know, the horror paperbacks with the cool covers, and you'd be like, oh, Dean Koontz, that kind of thing. So that's the same sort of uh, crowd that Stephen King would have been in the days of Pet Cemetery or, you know, these sort of pulp paperbacks. Um, yet it's still very readable. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Uh, to help you with these on your own, 
uh, one thing I just wanted to show you as well is if you run the readability test in here and you see that you know your grade is, is very high um, let, let's think across all these other books um, and things that I've looked at in the past I wouldn't really want to be going above an eighth grade um, sort of average that's that seems to be where most things fall in that that have a, a wider repeal or certainly the people don't get frustrated uh, trying to read you can actually in the readability tab here use the uncommon words in fiction report uh, i won't run it because it'll take some time on a full manuscript but just like these um readability tests some of them anyway are built using their word lists we have we have those word lists built into the system so you can search for it it'll bring up all the uncommon words that generally aren't found in fiction and you can revise or remove or as we like to say reject the uh, recommendation oh, yes. the way it is but these are things that are built in to help you to increase the readability a bit. There's also complex words. So you can run that report and we will bring up and highlight all the complex words. Uh, again, these are gonna be things that are uh, three syllables or more, uh, sometimes just longer words that uh, are a combination of both uncommon and filled with like X's and things like that. Mm. So you can quite easily use those and run along with the readability statistics and watch your readability change as you go um, and aim for that kind of I think that general sweet spot of uh, seventh, eighth grade. Absolutely. And I, I think even, uh, even more broadly, when you're looking at these test results, looking at each one, so where Gareth is displaying right now, the required grade level, and, and those are the nine that we just went through. Think back to some of the specialization in the development of some of these industry standard uh, readability tests. While they do vary in their score results, they also vary by how they were originally um, designed, what they really were focused on when they were designed. So looking at broad sweep across everything that's in, and let me just remove that banner so we can see it a little bit better. Looking at broad sweep across all those required grade levels, keeping an eye out for something that's quite high, a bit of an anomaly, for example, in this one, you know, smog is quite high, but then we consider back to um, how smog is calculated. It's really the healthcare material focused one. So thinking around that, in that score for my work, for example, would be less relevant. So I'm like, okay, I'm fine with that one saying it's an 8.3. Um, and once you've run your work through it a few times, you'll start to see your own pattern of scores in your typical writing and and one will resonate with you more than the others either based on your consistency uh, and it, how it aligns with how the score was originally designed you'll just find in my in my experience you'll just find one that really just resonates with you mine is the flesh kincaid readability which is down below um, I think, Gareth, that one was your favorite as well. And I think some of our audience members have mentioned that as well. <laughs> yeah, it is. The, it's just the most popular. Yeah. I think um, of the kind of ones that you would generally look at, I think, are New, New Deal Chawl and Fresh Kincaid. New Deal Chawl um, and Fresh Kincaid are my are probably two. The, the power two these days. Um, but yeah, as, as Beth says, when you're looking at these, if you don't have a clue about what any of these readability tests are, or what readability means, um, you can look at this list and be super confused because it's a lot of numbers that don't add up and don't seem to have any correlation with each other. <laughs> That's just the, diff the nature of the different tests and what they're for. So it's really a case of pick one and stick with it. Mm -hmm. um, and of the available ones, probably the most, most prominent for, I guess, whether you're writing, uh, well, unless you're writing technical manuals and things like that, are going to be the New Deal Chawl and Flesh Kincaid. Agree. And, uh, flash reading ease as well, obviously. The reading ease, yeah. So the the um, difference being if you are writing technical manuals, we do have that as well. So if you're uh, writing more technical materials, if you're specifically doing something around healthcare, you know, there are a lot of tools out there that will, that will be um, more helpful for you. And you'll just uh, be able to select things that are more prevalent or more relevant for your work out of all the offerings that we have here. So as you might have guessed, um, 
I may have lied about there not being a quiz. So <laughs> 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 not oh, Beth. I know, I know. So the quiz is very easy though. It is almost a gimme, almost. It does not have to do with the square root of anything. Um, all those math classes, when you wondered when you would ever use them, now is also not the time. So when we talk about uh, readability scores, I, we mentioned at the start of this broadcast, there are three primary aspects that come into play. So who remembers those? What are a few easy ways you can increase readability in your own books? And that'll, you know, kind of open up your market a little bit more. Everybody loves the FK. I need to see that. So think about, I'm going to, and I'm going to do a little twist. Uh oh. So I may have lied about the quiz and, and Garrett thought that was funny. And now oh, it's all lies tonight. And now it's all lies. And now I've lied about something that I'm going to ask Gareth to do as well. Um, think about not just how you can improve your readability score, but what reports in AutoCrit can you use to help you with that? And honestly, Gareth literally just showed us at least two of those um, and just mentioned them. So think about that and let's hear it in the comments. And Gareth, I'm going to, I'm going to let, uh, let your screen come back so people can at least have a little bit of a cheat and see the, the, categories across the top, even if we're not going to show all the reports underneath each of those categories. The readability has to do with three major things and how you can, uh, how you can really improve your own readability should you choose to do so. And as a spoiler, ooh, nice, getting some answers in here. Um, I do, of course have a slide for that but it's the same one we talked about at the start of today's show three things to think about the complexity of your words so how many syllables how many letters how many characters in those words word complexity and gareth i believe there is an auto crit report for that which one do we recommend yeah, well, we have the, the two there I mentioned. We've complex words and uncommon words in fiction. We'll literally highlight both of those for you. Um, so it makes it super easy to actually find them when you're uh, you know, going through a, a pass. Yeah. Um, we also have uh, a report for repeated uncommon words. Ooh. So let's say you have used an uncommon word once. Um, it would be fine to use it the once, but maybe you want to get rid of the second one. And the repetition, uncommon word repetition report will uh, highlight all those for you where, where you have a, both a problem with using uncommon words and repetition at the same time because the yeah. two goes together. <laughs> so you get a bit of, bit of extra help there. So indubitably, and you use that word 20 times in three <laughs> paragraphs, we're, we're going to want to zero in on that one. So definitely great suggestions. Shorten those sentences. If a sentence feels long, so when we do have the um, sentence variation report as well. Might that be a good one for this, Gareth, do you think? Yes, certainly. Yeah, so if your sentence feels long or if you see a lot of sentence variation, an average of around nine words is, is about right for fiction. Um, split it in half, make it two sentences. You can also use that as a technique to vary your sentence starters, which we've recently talked about. Um, a little bit of rewriting can really help you get in there uh, and break that up into something that's more bite-sized and readable and therefore accessible to, to the broad majority of, of readers in your audience. Replacing those complex words that Gareth mentioned, um, looking out for words that are three syllables or more. Um, you know what? Don't use utilize when you can just say use, just say the word that you mean. Um, but keeping it, uh, keeping it simple instead of trying to brag about your vast vocabulary, um, often is an easier and more clear way to communicate and to get your message across. Um, some people have those favorite words like utilize, and that's where we say again, kill your darlings. Your darling doesn't have to be a character. Your darling can be a fancy, fancy word that uh, yep. many people love. Your darlings may actually be your favorite turns of phrase, but uh, you know, yeah. as you know, that's where it comes from. Kill your darlings. Um, yep. You have to. Uh, if you want to make it accessible, if you want Absolutely. people to get annoyed and not read it, 
that's fine. There, <laughs> there is an element, uh, I see in the comments of some people mentioning, you know, it seems like it's dumbing down the text. Not really. Um, I don't see being more clear in your communication as, as dumbing things down, essentially. But uh, do always be aware of, um, as was mentioned earlier um, in the stream, your your audience. Um, if your audience likes it complex, they like things, um, uh, you know, more uncommon words and things, and you get away with it, by all means, I mean, you know, have, have fun with it. Um, but in terms yeah. of readability, it's like things like shortening sentences, cutting a sentence in half. That's not dumbing anything down. That's simply turning what could cause somebody to run out of breath or get caught up in the middle mm -hmm. into something that's much more easy to read. The same message is there, but the actual reading experience is easier. So yeah. that's in no way dumbing down. And that, and that kind of brings back to mind something that came up at the start of our broadcast as well. Know your audience. If your audience likes rapid fire, quick paced, you know, fiction, you know, the Lee Childs, Jack Reacher sort of situation, then you're going to want to keep that readability level on par, right? So you could, in the Autocrit professional version, compare your work to Lee Child. Uh, conversely, you know, if they like something more complex, if they, if you're writing a nonfiction technical manual, you'll want to compare it to some something different and look at readability scores um, that are in line with what your targeted fan base, what your targeted reader enjoys, embraces, um, really, really connects with because having your message get out there uh, is your goal. This is your creative work. We want you to be able to take all of this into consideration and then ultimately still make your own decisions. We can tell you the stats and look, look at the patterns with you and, and help you by providing lots of data, but the ultimate decision around, do I want to swap out this word or re reduce the number of complex words I have, or am I doing that on purpose? That's where you as the creative, as the creative force behind all of your writing, really get to make those decisions and keep, keep that uh, voice true. I'm um, looking out for uncommon words. You know, if you're using it as a technique, if you're using it as um, a specific style indicator that you want to keep in your brand, absolutely. Um, but if you're if you're just not aware of it, we have a report that will show you and then let you make those decisions. So um, as always, uh, there was a quiz. Sorry about that. <laughs> not sorry. I'm not sorry at all. And as always, there's homework. There is always homework here on Deep Dive Live. And it is always fun. Right, Gareth? Um, he means, yes, it's always fun. Homework is the best all the time yes absolutely i love nothing more than homework check your own readability so if you have a work in progress if you have um your novel in the midst of editing pop in to the readability tab and just check out your scores and compare um some of the other scores from popular books on our what's the score blog and i have a banner for that i'm just going to pull that up real quick um Gareth has done a ton of analysis on many, many, many amazing popular novels and books on our What's the Score series. Out there on our blog, you can see the readability scores for uh, tons of authors. Stephen King, um, we just released Karen Slaughter, um, one of her recent books. Uh, Aaron Neville is out there if you're into horror. So take a peek at some of your most, uh, I, some of your, I, I don't want to say idolized. That sounds weird. S take a look at some other popular authors and see where their readability falls, um, in terms of the types of books that they write and, and just kind of see how you measure up. Would love for you to share those scores in the autocrit author community on Facebook as well, and kind of, uh, see what score you like best and see where your scores are lining up and, how you'd like to take some steps to change that or? Yeah, I think I think many will be pleasantly surprised at how it comes out. Yeah. Um, just sort of seeing in the comments, I can see some people uh, appear to be generally worried about, oh, well, why do I have to get rid of 
all complex words and cut every sentence short and everything. It's it's not like that at all. Um, yeah. This is just kind of a, the formulas find ways around <laughs> that. <laughs> so don't worry. As sort yeah. of coming out, coming in with an average of, of nine words a sentence doesn't mean that every sentence in your book has to be nine words. In fact, it shouldn't be. Otherwise, it would be Ooh, super boy, repetitive. Super cool. Yeah. I feel myself getting hypnotized already with that. <laughs> so enjoy the freedom, but uh, yes, write, write your stuff and then check the readability at the end. Um, again, that's what the editing part is all about, and that's why it's in the uh, in the software and in the package. So, yeah. if your readability seems a bit high, you can maybe cut a little bit or split a few sentences to bring it down. But uh, you'll you'll actually find when you have an eye on readability with the F case, uh, especially, um, just a handful of changes can really shift the score. Um, it's not quite the uh, darling murder fest that you might think it is. <laughs> that's like a bloodbath of darlings. That's awful. <laughs> oh, that sounds. Oh, oh, this is. This is A, what we get for having a horror writer co-host co with me today, and B, why people find editing so so terrifying. <laughs> it's actually so <laughs> fun. <laughs> well, we hope you've enjoyed this. I know it's um, it's a lot to think about, but we would love to hear your thoughts and love to see your readability scores. And what would be so fun, I think, is if somebody has a few key phrases or a few key areas that they look at, um, as they're improving or changing their readability scores, um, let us know what reports you found helpful and what reports really moved the needle on your readability and uh, share that in our Facebook community. We'd love to hear from you. Yeah, talk about it. Yeah, yeah, with that being said, um, we're gonna sign off and we will see you here next week. Bye everybody. Thanks everyone.